part of the Earglue Media family of podcast. You're listening to Petticoats and Poppies. History Girls at the Movies. Welcome to Petticoats and Poppies, History Girls at the Movies. We're your hosts, Maggie and Nicole. It's July, which is the perfect month for summer blockbuster movies. So we decided to do something a little bit special, a little bit different. And the two films that we're going to talk about this month aren't actually period dramas. So actually quite a bit different for us. But they do have a lot to do with history and the sort of history field. So a few months ago, a friend of mine, Mary Claire, actually asked if we could do an episode on National Treasure. So today, here we are, ready to discuss one of the greatest films ever made. (laughs) Uh, So National Treasure came out in 2004. Uh, It is a Disney action adventure film that you can find streaming on Disney Plus right now. Uh, It was written by Jim Koff and the Weeberlies. Uh, it was directed by John Turtletab, who also directed one of Nicole's favorite films, While You Were Sleeping. Uh, it, of course, stars Nicolas Cage, uh, Harvey Keitel, John Voight, Diane Kruger, Sean Bean, Justin Bartha, and Christopher Plummer. Uh, it grossed $347 million worldwide, which is a pretty high number. <laughs> uh of course, received mixed reviews from critics. I mean, what do, what do critics know? <laughs> <laughs> I say <laughs> to the critic. <laughs> um, but I mean, let's be real. Some of our blockbusters like this never do well with the critics. It's all about the fans when it comes to these films. I also think that there's like a trend in that. I think if National Treasure came out today, it would have done a lot better with critics than it did in 2004. Because I think that critics today, partially maybe because critics are like a more diverse set than they mm-hmm. were in 2004, are a little bit more willing to have fun with the movie. Yeah, 100%. Uh, and then, of course, I think I recall the critics were also kind of on the fence about the sequel. <laughs> uh, National Treasure Book of Secrets, which was released in December 2007. But that, that's understandable. <laughs> so understandable. Uh, I cannot believe that this came out in 2004. I was in fourth grade when this came I hate, out. I hate to think about this. Right? Like, that's wild. Uh, but I love this movie growing up. I love it now. I think this movie is so fun. As a history kid, which I have been since basically I came out of the womb, this is sort of the jackpot as a movie. And it's actually a pretty unique movie in a lot of ways. Like, I can't think of many other films uh, like this that sort of deal with history in this way. And I have to say, my favorite character, not shockingly at all, is Riley. I love Riley. I realized this while totally watching this, checks for you. This like, is right, just well, you. I realized watching it, I was like, oh, yeah, okay. I always get overly attached to the sarcastic brunette side character. Just wait until I talk about who my favorite was. Oh, and I. Like, <laughs> you know. I'm fairly positive. I already know who it is. Yeah, yeah. I'm almost positive. But I like. I love Riley so much. His lines are just chef's kiss. Um, so fun. I think, speaking of fun, the editing in this movie is so fun. Like, I feel like you can tell that everyone involved with this movie was having a good time. Uh, the score is really great, too. Like, I think it's it's a really fun score. I will say, <laughs> Diane Kruger's German accent comes out occasionally in this movie, which cracks me up every time it happens. Uh, but okay, I have a question for Maggie. Yes. And I want to know, in your opinion, do you think their plan to steal the declaration would actually work? (laughs) And I'm not saying that Maggie and I are going to do it. Like, I'm not saying we're going to attempt it. But if we did attempt it, do you think we could do it? So here's the thing. I don't (laughs) think that their plan would work. But I think that there is a solid plan that you and I could cook up to actually (laughs) steal the Declaration of Independence. Because... I just I don't think that the party was the right angle and the right time to do it because there's going to be a lot of people around. I mean, look look at his stupidity and using his credit card to buy a yep. fake declaration yep. of independence. And let me just say, you're not going to pass off 
a, a gift store declaration of independence that right. swiftly. So I think you have to actually create a really convincing repo before you go in there. <laughs> and then I think that you need to go in with a little more like gravitas to be able to actually get access to it and then do the swap out. I feel like our strategy would be a little less Nick Cage and a little more, you know, the scene in the Avengers when Loki sweeps into that music. <laughs> well, That's you know, us. That's our we energy. Could, <laughs> we could also just go hit up the TVA and use there we go. a tin pad and just go steal the I practically of am Mobius already, so we might Wait, as well. <laughs> do you think Loki has stolen the Declaration of Independence? Absolutely, I do. Absolutely, uh, I do. <laughs> to do what with him? him? I'm not positive. You know, it was probably one of those like bets between him and Thor. Oh, totally. If he's D- <laughs> if he is DB Cooper, he definitely stole Precisely. the Declaration of Independence. Maybe he is Nick Cage. Who knows? <laughs> like, um, but I would like you to, heard it to here clarify. First. <laughs> I would really like to yes. clarify for legal reasons that Maggie and I do not have any plans to steal the Declaration of Independence for legal Yet. reasons. We do not plan. I repeat, to steal the Declaration of Independence. Continue on. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> rewatching this movie um, made me feel a- ancient, like <laughs> m- decaying corpse ancient. Um, this was 17 years ago. How? I just, I need somebody to explain the concept of the passage of time to me because I don't know how. <laughs> it's been 17 years. Uh, I saw this in theaters uh, as a kid. I'm pretty sure I went and saw it with friends. I might have just seen it with my mom. Um, I know that I loved it. Like, I was on the fence, like, trying to recall. 17 years is a long time ago. You know, when you get up there in age, you start forgetting things. Um, But I was trying to remember if I actually, like, liked this movie as a kid. Uh, And I do think that I actually did like it. Um, But I also realized that Ella Enchanted and The Princess Diaries 2 definitely overshadowed this movie for me that year. Uh, Because I was like, all about reading Ella Enchanted and all of the Meg Cabot books. And I think that I was very much in like that phase of my life. Uh, So I probably saw National Treasure and then was like moving on to the next thing. Uh, But I realized like at first when you suggested watching National Treasure, I was like, ugh, why? I hate that movie. (laughs) And I realized it's because I hate the second movie. And I think that for some reason, like, the second movie blended in with the first movie. Because when I started watching this last night, I was like, I really like this. I really, I like this. I remember liking this as a kid. Uh, So that just goes to show what a bad, like, second or third film can do to just ruin everything. Um, But I I really like Nick Cage, like, completely unironically. Like, his Ghost Rider is, like, one of my favorite bad movies. Um, (laughs) I just, I genuinely like Nick Cage. The thing about Nick Cage is that, like, whenever he makes a bad movie, it's a good bad movie. And mm-hmm. when he makes a good movie, like Moonstruck or something, it's a good movie. Like, he is a exactly. talented actor. He just also excels at making good bad movies. Yeah. And, you know, he's one of the few, like, nepotism kids that I'm, like, okay with. Yeah. Because, like, he's actually, like, pretty good. Um, and weirdly attractive, which I don't have time to unpack. <laughs> uh, but... Speaking of people who are attractive, please respect me and my privacy at this time as I I question why Sean Bean is so hot in this movie. I knew this is what it was going to be for you. I mean, this absolutely tracks that these would be the characters that we're into. And like, to be fair, I've always kind of liked Sean Bean. Like, I liked him in Lord of the Rings. I liked him in Game of Thrones. I forgot that he was in this movie and that he was the bad guy. And I'm confident that I knew this when I saw the movie as a kid because I was like really into Lord of the Rings and I have an action figure and the whole thing. But I really liked his character. (laughs) And I was like, why? Why is this me? I was like, Nicole's going to judge me, but she's going to like the nerd. So. Yep. Yep. That's (laughs) me. The nerdy sidekick and the villain. (laughs) Um, Feels right. But, you know, I like how this movie doesn't take itself super seriously, and I respect it for that. Um, I really wish, like you were talking about critics today, and, like, enjoy letting movies be weird and not good or good and, like, okay. Um, I wish that more films didn't take themselves so seriously, especially these, like, made-for-family, like, blockbuster, instant moneymakers, like, kid cult classic things. I wish... 
I wish that they would do that more often now. I feel like now people try too hard. Um, you know, it's just good fun, medium to low stakes, predictable. Um, this movie is basically the Da Vinci Code for kids, which I know the Da Vinci Code came out like two years after this movie, but the book had come out like two years beforehand. Uh, so it's the same kind of like, let's take this thing in history and turn it into a conspiracy theory and then people are going to go treasure hunting. And that's fun. That's good fun. Um, I will also say that I spent like the entire time eye rolling the existence of John Boyd because he's like a no go. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, of course, yeah. we didn't know this at the time. Like, there's yeah. a reason why Angelina Jolie is estranged from her father. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know, aside from that, the, the film was really fun. It is. It is. Uh, so I know that you are going to tell us all about the Declaration of Independence that we're definitely not going to steal. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I. This research was for this podcast only. Uh, (laughs) So one thing that Benjamin Gates, Nicolas Cage's character, points out in the movie, and actually one of my favorite scenes, is the fact that when these men signed the declaration, they were committing high treason. And it was actually quite a risky thing to do. And he says the men who did what was considered wrong to do what they knew was right. So I decided to take sort of a dual approach to this topic. And first, I'm going to talk about like the actual history of the Declaration as sort of a concept. When the American Revolution began, uh, it was seen more as American colonists fighting for better rights as British citizens. And the people who desired full independence were actually seen as quite radical in the beginning of the revolution and sort of the the edge of the party and everything. And people thought that that was quite extreme. But by 1776, a couple of years into the war, more and more people felt that independence was the correct step. And so a statement needed to be made to show that they were officially fighting for their independence. And in March of 1776, North Carolina, yes, I had to give a shout out to my state, uh, North Carolina's <laughs> convention voted in favor of independence and seven other colonies followed. So in early June of that year, Virginia, yes, we're giving a, a shout out to Maggie State now. Yes. <laughs> Virginia delegate, Richard Henry Lee. Uh, who's who from is, my town. He's and actually he, from my town. <laughs> well, he's one of my ancestors. So we're really- Wait, are you serious? Yeah, I am. Oh my, he's- Nicole, you're related to somebody else that I'm friends with. <laughs> oh, I love this. I love, I don't remember exactly what the line is, but like someone in my family did the the lineage and yeah. So, so like obviously the Lees of Virginia, but like my mentor in the museum industry is a Lee. Oh, I love this. Yeah, I am I am a, Lee, a Lees of Virginia descendant, so. The Lees of Virginia. This is bringing it all together. I've done, I've done so much with Richard Henry Lee. Like the museum I used to work at had a bunch of his stuff. This is oh, so I love weird. that. Oh, this is beautiful. Okay. I've, I've handled your ancestors' belongings. I love that so much. <laughs> <laughs> In any case, uh, good old Richard Henry Lee made a motion to call for independence in the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. And there was a heated debate because some people were not ready for that step. And obviously, as Nicholas Cage's character points out in the movie, to proclaim their independence was committing treason. And so for any man who signed his name on that document, if they had lost, there would have been really horrible, severe consequences for every man whose name was there. So they call a recess and they make a committee of five men from the Continental Congress, which is Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Roger Sherman, Robert R. Livingston, and Benjamin Franklin. And they're given the task of writing a formal declaration of the colony's intent. Now, what's actually quite funny is based on my research, uh, Thomas Jefferson is essentially the OG person who ends up doing the whole group project. Um, they all sort of look at him and they're like, hey, you're really good at writing. Why don't like you just do the whole thing? Uh, and Tommy Jefferson says, OK. <laughs> um, and he does actually consult with Adams and Franklin while writing it. But he writes a document. Um, which people didn't actually know that he wrote until like the 1790s. They they thought that it actually was written by all five men. Uh, but the Congress reconvenes on July 1st and 12 of the 13 colonies adopt Lee's movement for independence. And they keep revising the document until July 4th when it was formally adopted, which is why we now celebrate the 4th of July. 
What we now know, though, is that the document probably wasn't actually signed until August 2nd uh, is what I found. But, you know, they still did formally adopt it on the 4th of July. So fair enough. And the declaration later had like a very strong influence on the French Revolution and a lot of other democratic revolutions across the globe. I also found a cool article, though, on a website called popularmechanics.com called The Science of Saving the Declaration of Independence, which I thought was particularly relevant to this movie uh, because it, it sort of broke down what has happened to the actual document over time and why it's in such horrifically bad condition now. So this document shows a lot more rough handling and damage over the years, and it's a lot more battered than something like the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. The Continental Congress scribe Timothy Matlock used iron gall ink, which was cheap, commonly used for documentation, but unfortunately wasn't super high quality. And so over time, most of the ink has actually flaked off of the declaration. There's actually mm -hmm. not much like ink on there anymore. Uh, during the revolution, it didn't have a permanent home and it was often refolded, re-rolled and carried around places. So right from the beginning, it was sort of under a lot of wear and tear. John Quincy Adams had copper plate copies made in 1823, which he did because the document was under so much stress already. The issue is that in making these copper plate copies of it, uh, it eroded the document further and took a lot of the ink off at that time. The document was on display in the Patent Office Building, which is now the National Portrait Gallery, from 1841 to 1876, and during that time experienced significant light damage. Uh, because obviously documents like this are very damaged by light from the sun. Photographs of the document start being taken basically as soon as photography, you know, becomes a thing. And so we can confirm that at some point between 1903 and 1940, when we have photographs of it, a handprint shows up on the document. Hmm. Who put their handprint on the declaration? I would love to know. Um, was it was Loki? You know what? You know what probably happened? It was probably laying on somebody's desk, yep. and you know when you put your hand down on something and lean forward. Yep, that's probably exactly what happened. Which is like, yep. such a modern thing. Like you, you would think of like at an office or something like that. But you, for some reason, just don't picture people then doing it. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's a weird like thing of like, wait, what? <laughs> Like that at something so common could be a lasting permanent. Exactly. On like one of the most important documents for our country. <laughs> Seriously. Oops. Uh, it also has tears in it from humidity. It's, it's really struggled with humidity over the years. Obviously it's made its home um, for a long time now in Washington, DC, which is sort of in the South it gets really hot in the summer. Um, and oh, it gets so hot. Oh God, I know. Oh, in 1951, it was closed into this like enclosure thing. Um, that's a really scientific phrase for it uh, with humidified helium in the rotunda of the National Archives building. And it stayed there until 2001. But in 2001, they noticed that more damage was still occurring. So they changed it to a different container, which from what I could find is what it's still in today, uh, unless it's changed from like last year when this article was written. And it's a container that is airtight and it's made of aluminum, I almost said aluminum, okay, and titanium, and it's filled with argon gas, which has a relative humidity at 40%, which is supposedly better for the document. But essentially, it's in terrible pore shape. So if somebody took it and, you know, started doing things to the back of it. <laughs> you know, uh, in, the, in the movie, when it, when she drops it and it rolls into the street. Yep, yep. It would have disintegrated inside of the roll from the drop alone. Like, truly, it would not have survived what they do to it in the movie. Literally, um, the, the second they take it out of the National Archives, it's done. Like, I, my thing with it is, I think the most unrealistic thing about the movie and the way that they treat the Declaration isn't the fact that they were able to steal it. I think that's actually more believable than the fact that it wouldn't have been incredibly damaged, like, 20 minutes into them having it. Uh, mm -hmm. because it's already not, not that I'm like saying that they were handling it too roughly because like they, they weren't necessarily like another document from that time would have been fine, but it's already in such terrible condition, uh, that it would never have survived. <laughs> no, not even a little bit. 
Um, so I guess that there's a really no natural segue uh, into the Freemasons. It's like um, the other main topic of this movie. I feel yeah, like. it's like the only two things that this movie really talks about. Um, but so Nicole tasked me with researching the Freemasons uh, without the knowledge that my grandfather was a Freemason. Uh, he passed away when I was really young and my father never ended up joining the uh, Freemasons. So like, unfortunately, I don't know any Masonic secrets, uh, but I think that it did instill like this sense of like mystery about secret orders when I was a kid. Uh, Because, like, I definitely was aware of what the Freemasons was as a child. Um, But like the movie said, uh, nine out of the 55 signers of the Declaration of Independence are said to have been Freemasons, including George Washington himself. Uh, But who are the Freemasons? Uh, The Freemasons are a fraternal order that happens to be the largest worldwide secret society. It is estimated that there are somewhere between 2 million and 6 million Freemasons currently. Oh. Uh, Yeah, like, you probably know some Freemasons. Freemasons essentially evolved from guilds of stonemasons and cathedral builders that existed during the Middle Ages. Uh, It was quite literally just about masonry in the beginning. Uh, Freemasonry officially began in 1717 with the founding of the First Grand Lodge, an association of Masonic lodges in England. Uh, Freemasons are divided into three major degrees, an entered apprentice, fellow of the craft, and a master mason. Uh, There is no longer um, like a literal connection to masons. These people are not masons by trade anymore. I'm sure there are a few, uh, but most of them are are not. They have every career field uh, imaginable. Um, It's really just a philosophical thing now. Um, Female relatives of Master Masons may join the Order of the Eastern Star, uh, which is open to both women and men, and it is an extension of the Freemasons. Uh, It's here in the United States. I believe it's in England, and it's in a few other countries as well. I was actually invited to join them, but I decided not to get myself involved with the Secret Society, Um, which I think is just such a weird thing. Um, I maybe you should have you could you could have written a really cool uh, book. <laughs> oh, uh, speaking of writing books, uh, let me tell you a story. Okay. Uh, so the hatred for Freemasons led to the first third party political party founded in 1828 here in the United States. They are the reason that we have like a vague three party system. It was called the Anti Masonic Party. <laughs> But what do you think caused this this hatred? What? In, in the months leading up to September 12th, 1826, a Mason by the name of William Morgan infiltrated the Freemasons in New York. It was in upstate New York. Uh, he threatened to publish a book exposing the powerful organization's tactics, and they reacted very badly. He was jailed and subsequently bailed out by the Freemasons and never seen again. Oh, shit. Okay, don't write a book. (laughs) Interestingly, he was from Culpeper, Virginia, which is like right next to where I live. And he married a girl from Richmond, Virginia, who after uh, he died, like, okay, so he was like 50 something when he died. He was 45-ish when he married her, and she was, like, 19, which obviously is not weird for back then, but, like, yeah. modern standards is quite odd. But get this. So she – this is not Freemasons, but it, I researched this, like, whole thing thoroughly today, and my poor mother had yep. to listen to me talking about it. Okay, so <laughs> this girl, she was from Richmond, Virginia, and her name was okay. Lucinda. Okay. Uh, so she moves up to New York and marries William. William goes missing. He's presumed dead. She moves. And she moves out west and she marries Joseph Smith. And she's one of the original wives of Joseph Smith when he was founding the Mormons. No. Yes. Absolutely not. No. I was like, how how are you married (laughs) to a man who tried to take down the Freemasons? And then you went and married (laughs) Joseph Smith. I'm. (laughs) I was shook. 
I'm like reading through this and it's just getting weirder and weirder because there was like this whole thing where like people have been trying to figure out what happened to William Morgan. There's like one theory that they took him to Niagara Falls and they threw him over because like they're not technically too far from that. And then like a year after he went missing, this body washed up on the Ontario lakes and they thought it was him. But then like three months later, this other guy who had been missing from Canada somewhere his wife identified it based off like some part of his clothing on the body so like then they were like oh well I guess it's not William Morgan and they had already buried the body as William Morgan and then this wife was like that's actually my husband and then like in eight I think it was like I can't remember when it was exactly it was like 18 it was a while later it was like 1880 I want to say they were like erecting a statue for William Morgan which I think is still standing uh, in Bratvia, New York. And around the same time at the um, uh, reserve that's not far from there, they found a body and they found a ring on the body that had the initials WM on it and like some sort of written like papers or stuff that had writing on it that they assumed to be from William Morgan. And so they assumed it was William Morgan, but then everybody was like, actually, this is just a publicity stunt. Like, because they were trying to get the statue up. It was a whole thing. And, like, the book was published, but the book really didn't reveal anything. So they, like, killed him for no reason. And this caused all of this hatred for the um, Masons. And it's actually what led to, like, the next 40 years, like, Freemasons had a really hard time getting any positions of power. Like, they lost almost every election they ran for because of this one incident. Like, the, so, like, there is some merit to the idea that they were so desperate to keep secrets that, like, they almost caused their own undoing. And, like, <laughs> the Freemasons are apparently still very hated, which I personally did not know because I found that, like, organized religions have been largely and actively against the Freemasons since their inception. Like, while the organization is not a Christian organization, the men within the order do believe in, like, a supreme being. And that's what it's called, a supreme being. And this, and I guess because there are very, like, pagan attributes, this is some hypocrisy right here. So, like, Freemasonry has a lot of paganistic attributes to the ceremony and regalia and the whole thing. But so does the Catholic Church. Um, right. And the, and the Catholic Church actually banned anyone in the Catholic Church from ever joining the Freemasons in like 1981 like not even that long ago they still are like actively against the Freemasons I (laughs) what yeah so like and like the Freemasons like are not I don't think they're a bad organization necessarily because I do know like Freemasons who do a lot of like fundraisers and food drives and like programs for like communities like they try to be good but they also are not the greatest people like please freemasons if any of any of you are listening to me please don't come for me uh but there are like a lot of reports of lodges um who are very um prejudiced against um those of the jewish faith obviously catholics with this like weird animosity um and like they definitely have some racism going on so there's like definitely something going on there i don't think that they are up to anything national treasure level. Um, But I think it is probably just a garden variety boys club with some casual racism, sexism thrown in. Um, Definitely no national secrets or treasure. I feel like if there was some sort of treasure, they'd already have, you know, done away with it. And then there's like the whole stuff with like the Knights Templar, which I think personally, this is my uneducated opinion. I think the whole Knights Templar thing is like a stretch. I think it's fun. It makes for a really fun story. Yeah. But I don't I don't see knights being like, hey, you know where would be a great place to hide our treasure? America. <laughs> <laughs> true. I mean, very true. <laughs> um, but it's it's fun. And I think it makes for a really fun story. And I think the Freemasons are definitely intriguing. But I think any secret society is going to be intriguing. And I think that by the nature of an organization that is cloaked in secrecy, people are going to be coming up with all sorts of far-fetched theories about what's really going on. And I think they're all probably unfounded. 
but I do think it, I do think it's interesting. And I thought the whole thing with like the Catholic church being like, no, is hilarious, especially if it's about their ceremonies, because, uh, have you looked in the mirror guys? (laughs) Right. Like, uh, uh, just very interesting. That's like this kind of stuff, like the weird, like this guy who went missing and like the Freemasons almost undid themselves by being a little too keen to keep things secret uh, is fascinating. I, wow. Okay. See, I knew, I knew whenever I, I asked you if you could do this topic that you would deliver. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I didn't know that you would be the descendant of a Freemason, but I knew that you would deliver. So. <laughs> yes. Yes. And you've heard my weird, my weird stories off. <laughs> I have. Air. I have. I, uh, I feel like the Freemasons and like, Again, if we have a Freemason listening, I, I, I say this uh, not as a criticism, but it feels sort of like a grown-up fraternity. Oh, yeah. I mean, it definitely is. Um, but, like, most of the, the people are, like, this is just my experience with the Freemasons that I have encountered uh, over the years, which is actually a very odd uh, High, highly odd number, <laughs> oddly high number. Let me say that correctly. Um, are mostly like over sixty, I'd say, like fifty and up. I have never met a Freemason who was my age. I have met some of. There's this other society that's not necessarily secret society. It's like the Society of Cincinnatus. I do know a lot of young oh. people in in that organization. Okay, and that's okay. A, I believe that's a fraternal. A fraternal order as well. Oh, interesting. All right. All right. All right. Look at this. I. Yeah. <laughs> Secret society. If anyone listening knows knows fun things about the Freemasons, like, please do get in touch. I'd love to hear. Oh, please. Well, speaking of Freemasons. <laughs> uh, I also want to talk about one of the lesser known historical figures that they mention in this movie, which is Charles Carroll. And in National Treasure, he is the person in uh, Nicholas Cage's character's grandfather's story, like at the beginning, who supposedly told Thomas Gates the secret of the treasure right before his, you know, death. And I decided to look into him. He is a real person, or he was a real person. Uh, he actually is not believed to have been a Freemason, but his son, also named Charles Carroll, was definitely a Freemason. So... You know, close enough. Close enough. Uh, he's also known as Charles Carroll of Carrollton, uh, which is, I believe, what he signed on the declaration. This is because there were a lot of Charles Carrolls in the colonies, and he wanted everyone to be sure that uh, everyone knew that it was him that they were talking about. So, he, especially, <laughs> there's a whole Carroll County in Maryland named. Exactly. For them. Yeah. 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 Uh, so he was born on September 19th. Uh, which is also Remy Grimley's birthday, Mackie. Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in 1737 in Annapolis, Maryland, he studied at Jesuit colleges, first in Maryland and then in France until 1765, and then studied law in France and England. So he spent 16 years abroad before he finally came home. He spoke five languages. He was a planter and a politician, and he inherited large land estates. He was his parents' only child, so he inherited all of their wealth. He was actually the wealthiest man in the American colonies as of 1775. Hmm. And he had, in 2019, money, which was whenever this calculation was done. I did not attempt to, you know, recalculate it myself. Uh, He had about $376,012,500. Five hundred dollars, hmm. which you know is a lot of money, uh, <laughs> and he had a ten thousand acre estate in Maryland with about one thousand enslaved peoples, uh, people. So obviously, he was an important guy in the colonies. Mm-hmm. He was a delegate to both the Continental Congress and the Confederation Congress, and in seventeen seventy six, I actually didn't know this occurred. He went to Canada with Benjamin Franklin and a few other people to try to convince the Canadians to join the American cause. Which, like, I guess somewhere in my brain, I should have realized that like that happened, uh, but I had never heard that the Americans tried to get the Canadians to join them. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the Canadians said no. 
Uh, so he was unsuccessful in that, but he did come back and he served in the Maryland Senate from 1777 to 1800. He was also the first U.S. Senator from Maryland uh, from 1789 to 1792. He left the U.S. Senate in 1792 because Maryland passed a law that you couldn't be in both the Maryland Senate and the U.S. Congress. And he chose the Maryland Senate, which I think actually goes a large way towards um, showing the importance of states' rights in the early years of the United States that he, you know, thought it was more important to be in the Senate for Maryland than for the whole country. Mm hmm. He was really dedicated to ensuring religious freedom in the colonies. And they think that a lot of the stuff in the declaration about, you know, sort of religious freedom, that sort of thing is maybe because of him. Uh, and that's because he was Roman Catholic and he was actually the only Roman Catholic to sign the declaration. He became a federalist whenever political parties formed and eventually left politics uh, and afterwards lived a pretty quiet life other than participating in the formation of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Company. He, as it's said in the movie, was the last surviving signer of the Declaration, and he died 56 years after signing it uh, at the age of 95 on November 14th, 1832. Uh, but whenever he signed it, he was the wealthiest, best educated, and only Roman Catholic man to sign it. So he actually is a like pretty important person to the Declaration's history, so I can see why they would have chosen him um, to highlight in this film as the one who, you know, is the person who sort of passes on this knowledge of the map on the declaration. And not to be a conspiracy theorist, but uh, <laughs> Charles Carroll was a member of the Society of Cincinnati. Oh my God, there we go. Uh, so <laughs> I might need to research this secret society more. Uh, but I, while you were talking, I looked up the Society of Cincinnati just to you know, bring a little bit of information up to that since I brought it up and I didn't want to leave any of our devoted listeners hanging. Uh, but the Society of Cincinnati is a fraternal, um, wow, I can't say hereditary for some reason, is a fraternal <laughs> hereditary society with the 13 consti uh, constituent societies in the United States and one in France. It was founded in 1783. George Washington was a member Charles oh. Carroll was a member, and a lot of the people who signed the Declaration of Independence were members of this secret society. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. So, um, waiting for the National Treasure 4 that goes into... Wait, was there a third one? Was... No. Was there? Uh, I'm one. looking this up, because why did I just say the fourth one? I feel like... I don't remember there... I remember the idea of a three. Oh my god, there was a third one. Oh my god. Wait. Oh wait, no, it's in production right now. <laughs> oh! <laughs> How did I not know there was a national treasure being made? Oh! Yeah, okay, yeah, it's currently being made. Well, there we go. Okay, well, if it's about the Society of Cincinnati, <laughs> uh, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> um, okay, so... I'm going to talk about costumes, and this movie is not my usual costume movie, so I really <laughs> don't have a lot to say, so your Society of Cincinnati uh, segment was a bonus segment for you. Um, <laughs> like, the only piece of costuming in this movie that really, like, caught my attention was the dress that Diane Kruger wears at the event at the beginning of the movie. Everything else was, like, street clothes, and nothing was really, like cool in my opinion i'm not a big fan of just like regular everyday clothes and movies so nothing really caught my attention i personally did not like the suit that diane wore when she was in her office but then i was like it's nope. 2004 maggie that was the look <laughs> i searched around and it was like a theory suit or something that was like super expensive oh, okay. it was like designer it looked terrible it did nothing for her <laughs> shape so glad that society has moved beyond shapeless outfits and puka shells um the costumes were designed by uh judanna makovsky uh who is probably best known for her work on some marvel movies in fact she did the costumes for captain america civil war which has become my most watched marvel movie for no reason other than daniel Bruhl. anyways <laughs> Uh, she also did the costumes for Winter Soldier, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. She's working on the upcoming Volume 3. Uh, she's also working with James Gunn on Suicide Squad. She did the costumes for X-Men Last Stand. She also did the costumes for Sorcerer's Stone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And she costumed Matt Damon back in 2000 uh, in the legend of Bagger Vance. Okay. Okay. You you really thought you were going to. I really thought I might. I got to say, though, um, you know, like you said, the costumes in this movie aren't anything particularly special. But I do. I do love her work on Civil War and Winter Soldier. Uh, Big fan. We could give a personal thank you um, for both Steve's incognito outfit and um the, Bucky's. the bucky look in the burgundy uh henley yes um, that burgundy I, henley you know you can find a really similar one on amazon for about ten dollars if you order it it'll arrive in like two days and i'm not saying i've done that i just want to thank her for the outfit that zemo wears in russia I think yes. it's a really good look. Um, yes. Even, and his outfit in the airport. I've definitely watched that scene a few times. <laughs> a few times? How, how, how many? It's, it's like that TikTok sound. It's like, uh, how many times? <laughs> hundred I'm, times? I am, I'm not ashamed to admit. <laughs> uh, so previously, the only Marvel movie, and it's not even technically Marvel, the only Marvel movie that I had watched of the new movies, I'm not counting X-Men, I watched X-Men all the time. I had only seen Into the Spider-Verse like Mm. eight times which is obviously sony but also still kind of marvel who knows confusing um i had seen that like eight times i've now seen civil war 13 times um Uh, how many how many times is that how many it was 13 um but who's keeping count i love that for you that's just since april (laughs) i love that for you no one asked me how many times i've uh i've watched crimson peak lately (laughs) I feel like it's probably in the, like, teens now. (laughs) Nobody needs to know. (laughs) Nobody needs to know. (laughs) The fact that I literally just thought, like, oh, I could put it on again later tonight. (laughs) I had that thought about Civil War earlier. (laughs) There we go. There we go. We are nothing if not cliches of ourselves. Yep. You liking the nerdy boy, me liking the villain. It all makes sense. Uh, Our viewers always know, or listeners always know what to expect from us because we are... (laughs) Always on brand. Nothing if not consistent. (laughs) Always consistent. And we are going to be bringing you another super fun summer blockbuster later this month uh, that I am personally very excited to talk about. No, it's not a Marvel film. Uh, Though, (laughs) though. (laughs) we could theoretically work in the first Avenger as a summer blockbuster. Uh, (laughs) Uh, um, uh, I will say... The movie that we are planning on doing is not a Marvel film, but it does have a very exciting Marvel actor in it. Yes. Uh, it does. Uh, a fave of mine. <laughs> it, it has perhaps my favorite role he has ever played. Seriously, like one of my favorite characters uh, that I keep <laughs> wishing still existed. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, that's what we're going to tease you with. Thank you for listening to our 28th episode. Make sure that you come back next time. Uh, but thank you, you for listening be to our 28th <laughs> episode of Petticoats and Poppy's History Girls at the Movies. We would love to hear from you on social media and hear what you thought about National Treasure. You can find us on social media at HGATM Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find Maggie over at Maggie of the Town, and you can find me at Nicole Ackman 16. And you can find me and Nicole and another of our friends on the Starbucks Lovers podcast. The second episode of that comes out over at the Geeky Waffle tomorrow, the 13th. So if you're listening to this, and no, two days from now, whenever it comes out, the 13th, when you listen to this, you'll be able to hear Nicole talking about some Taylor Swift with me and another friend. Woo-hoo. You can also... You can also listen to Petticoats and Poppies on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, the Airglue Media website, and Audible. If you like what you hear, don't forget to leave us a rating over on Apple Podcast and on Podchaser. Every few episodes, we'll be reading our reviews, so be sure to leave us one if you would like to be featured. We'll be back next time with another episode as we continue to look at period films, and occasionally not period films, from a history and film perspective. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and have a great summer. Okay, so I have the blueprints for the National Archives. Are you ready for this? (laughs) You've been listening to Petticoats and Poppies. History Girls at the Movies.
Lee's of Virginia.